Thank you. Thank you very much. These lights are pretty bright, so I can't really see you, but I know you're there. I'm delighted to be with you again in Rochester. I'd like to welcome you all here, and um, like to welcome my mother, too. She's here. Mom is here with, uh, with our good friend, Gloria DeLuise, and uh, I'm delighted they could make it. It's been a while uh, since I've seen either one of them. So we're delighted to uh, have them here. This weekend, we're going to film an, a new series. We're going to be uh, filming a, um, a series for television and other purposes, uh, so you will be um, part of the uh, happy history. The title of this new series is Come Home to the Catholic Church. Why I did and why you should. Now a lot of you may say, as has often been said, um, you're preaching to the choir. And I know that, but what we're really doing is the same thing that Jesus did and the same thing that the Holy Father does. The Pope's primary job is to confirm the brethren, confirm the brethren. And that's what we do is we try to confirm the brethren, confirm you in your faith, help you to be stronger, uh, more clear in the faith. And then you go out to the rest of the world and you draw them. We know we have had a major, major problem um, in the Catholic Church with respect to the number of people that are actively participating in the faith. Uh, there was a time when mass attendance um, was probably 75 to 80 percent. It's down to about 20 percent now in North America in general. Now there are places where it's better than that and there are places where it's worse than that. But on average it's about 20 percent. That means 80 percent of Catholics don't even go to church on Sunday. And that's a precept. You have to do that. Many have just flat fallen away. And so we're going to consider that this weekend. The first one that I'll deal with this evening is why we leave the Catholic Church. And as I said, now I know that every one of us has a friend or a relative that falls into that category. You know, we, we all. Uh, have somebody in the family like them. Um, why we leave, or perhaps why they don't come. Uh, we, we should be attracting millions. After all, we have the fullness of truth, the full means of salvation. The second, which will be tomorrow morning, what we have in the Catholic Church. I've always said if, if we knew what we had, we would never leave. If people knew what they had, they would never leave. You couldn't. But of course, many do leave and they don't know what they have. Even many who stay don't really know what they have. They go through the motions quite frequently, never really learning their faith, able to live it as fully 
as God calls us to. The third lecture will be a perspective on truth. Truth. Uh, truth is not a subjective construct. Truth is not something that we make up as we go along. Truth is not something that we choose some of it and reject other elements of it. The truth is what it is. It's absolute, it's objective. The bottom line is the truth is not something. The truth is somebody. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's the truth. And then the fourth will be on human freedom. Human freedom, a two-edged sword. Human freedom, there is so much confusion in the world and even in the church concerning authentic human freedom. Uh, there's a very common fallacious presupposition that would have you believe, at least subconsciously, that freedom is being able to do whatever you want to do. That is not freedom. That is not freedom. Uh, if that were freedom, if you didn't agree with me, I could throw you out the window or off the roof or run over you with my four-wheel drive truck. But that's not freedom. That's license. And you see today there's a terrible confusion between freedom and license. Under the specious pretext of freedom, we have become a licentious society. With that fallacious presupposition, that false premise, that freedom is being able to do whatever you want to do. And so in this great country, we now have all kinds of destructive influences unleashed under the specious pretext of freedom. Abortion, pornography, under the heading of freedom of expression, free speech, freedom to choose, baloney. That's not freedom. That's license. And we've got to get that right. A failure to discern between freedom and license can ultimately prove fatal. When you abuse freedom, and that's what license is, when you abuse freedom, ultimately you lose freedom. We are headed towards slavery. This nation is headed toward slavery. Jesus said the man who sins becomes the slave of sin. The real problem is sin. The real problem is in the will. Authentic human freedom, that's power. Authentic human freedom is the power to choose what is true and good. To choose the highest and best thing. And of course, that's God. But if you're not truly free, you'll choose things much less than God. All right. Let me preface this conference this evening uh, on why we leave the church. Uh, I, I always try to give the short version and then a little, little more expounded version. Um, you can almost always trace it to one thing. Why we leave the church. Pride. Pride. Arrogance. Self-centered pride. Now, pride is at the root of all sin. Pride is basically what gave birth to evil in the universe. Starting with the fall of the angels and then the fall of humanity. Having said that, let me also say that quite frequently, quite frequently, and I'm not justifying it, um, but quite frequently people leave the church because we do not do things the way we ought to. 
uh, in the church an example. Now, we've heard about vocations crisis now for many years, right? We have a vocations crisis. And, uh, you know, I, I, I consider myself home right now, okay? I'm in upstate New York. I, I'm, I'm from the Albany Diocese. You know, we've got the Rochester Diocese here. So I'm home. You know what a vocations crisis is. You know what that means, being from this area. And you're not, you're not alone. Many, many areas. There is no vocations crisis. None. None. There is none. Got to wake up and smell the roses. There is no vocations crisis. God has not stopped calling people to the priesthood, to religious life, to the lay state, of course. We, but we generally think of a, of a vocations crisis in the priesthood. Let me tell you how not to have vocations. Disobey the church. Do not accept the teaching of the magisterium of the church. Badmouth the Pope and send them to lousy seminaries. You will have no vocations. Kiss them goodbye. It is absolutely fatal to play fast and loose with faith and morals. Things are getting better, but we've gone through a very dry period in the church. I can give you example after example of religious congregations and dioceses that are ju doing just great with vocations. Why? Because they're faithful. Period. Because they're faithful. They don't play games with the doctrine of the faith. They don't try to promote in seminarians a kind of attitude of liberal dissent. That is the kiss of death. And I can prove it time and time and time again. Wherever that's done, there are no vocations. And there won't be. There won't be. Where things are done properly, there are vocations. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. First thing a, a bishop should do is galvanize his people into action. Uh, by the way, you can't have a church without priests. You can't. I know it's the age of the laity, and that's a good thing. The laity have a lot of work to do, and they should be given their appropriate work. But you cannot have the church, authentically speaking, without priests. Why? No priest, no Eucharist. No Eucharist, no church. Period. Exclamation point. The girls that worked in my office for a long time, they had a, a plaque on the wall. It says, no priest, no Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source, center, and summit of the church's life. No priest, no source of the church's life. No priest, no center of the church's life. No priest, no summit of the church's life. You've got to have ministerial priests. And you can have them in abundance. You've got to pray for them. During the scandals, a woman saw me in an airport and grabbed me by the lapel. She was very angry. And she said, I'm mad at you priests. And I said, oh yeah, me too. <laughs> Honey, you don't have to dress like this in public. I asked her in the last 
many years that she's been Catholic, which was all her life, like 70 years or so. I said, how much time during those years have you spent praying for priests? And she looked at me with a dull look. Have you ever seen a deer in the headlights? It was a look kind of like a look like that, you know, blank. How much time have you spent praying for priests? The answer was none. So shut up in plain English. You got nothing to complain about. You don't pray for priests, don't expect much in plain English. You've got to pray for your priest. And I don't mean just a little minute here and there. That's better than nothing. But I mean you got to get busy. I'll tell you some stories during the course of the, the weekend. You know, I, I would have never believed 20 years ago when I started preparing for the priesthood, I would have never believed some of the stuff I'd have to go through uh, as a priest. Uh, no, back then, no one would have had any idea. You, you, you couldn't prepare a seminarian for this. I, I, it's just unbelievable. If I had known, I might have chickened out. If I would have known back then, I might have turned tail and run. Oh, you have no idea some of the nonsense. If I, you know, if I weren't so mean and ornery, I'd have been gone a long time ago, and I mean it. One time, a, a, one of my elderly lady friends uh, said to me at a conference someplace, and I didn't really know her, but she's my friend. I have a lot of them all over the country. They watch my shows on television, and, and I consider them friends and family. And she said, Father, I know your greatest gift. I said, you do? And she said, oh yes. And it's not preaching. <laughs> oh? <laughs> she got my attention there. I... <laughs> she said, no, your greatest gift is that you don't give a fat rats. <laughs> who likes it and who doesn't? I said, amen, honey. <laughs> amen. You are right. And then she went on to further explain how that's an essential gift for a preacher. Because if you are so preoccupied with what people think about you, and what they're going to think about what you say, you might not say it. You just can't be concerned with public opinion. So, why? Do they leave the Catholic Church? Oh, there's so many reasons, but let's try to articulate some of them. The biggest thing is, and as I said, one of the things at the outset, one of the greatest things we can do to stem the, the, the tide of exodus from the church is to do things right. Don't mess with the liturgy. Don't mess with the doctrine of the faith. Don't mess with the moral teaching of the church, because if you mess with it, that's a sure way to drive people out. That's guaranteed. So just be faithful, do things right, and I, I could, well, I, I would never do it because I'm not a parish priest, and that's not my gift, but I'll guarantee you, give me a parish someplace that's empty and broke and I'll fill it up and have it well off in one year guaranteed and, and what magical thing would you do father I, I wouldn't do anything magical I would just do what the church does as faithfully as possible and and I'll tell you what people would come I've had priest friends do this all over the country and they have people driving three and four hours just to go to Mass at their parish on Sunday. That's all you have to do. Do it right. Why do they leave? Well, number one, they stop going to Mass. Okay, that, that's where it usually begins. They stop going to Mass. 
Now, how do fallen away Catholics become fallen away? Well, number one, they stop going to Mass. Now, in case you have heard to the contrary, assisting at the Holy Eucharist on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligations, unless you have a good reason, you know, you're sick, you have a sick child, and so forth, but that's a precept. It is a mortal sin, objectively taken, to miss Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, unless you have a good reason. Now, you don't believe me, look it up in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I didn't make that up, it says it right in there. Why? Because we need it. Most of us wouldn't think about depriving our bodies of one good meal a week. And yet, 80% of Catholics deprive their souls of the holy meal of the, the Holy Eucharist. We need it. Why? Human beings have a supernatural end. You understand that? Um, th this can be summed up in one of the old questions in the old Baltimore Catechism. Now, I know y'all, many of you remember that, right? You and I, we learned our faith from that in the old days. I remember Sister Mildred. I, I, had, a, I, I had a nun, Sister Mildred, in the third grade. She was an old school nun. Uh, you know what I mean, too, don't you? Yeah. She is well armed. She, she had, she had uh, small arms and heavy artillery. She had a big old yardstick and she had a little, little ruler. And she was equally adept with either weapon. And, and old sister, she, Sister Mildred didn't walk. Sister Mildred floated. Man, she come in the classroom, she didn't walk in, Sister floated, man. Sister would float in that classroom. And, boy, and, she, and sister, we were scared of her, and not just because of the weapons either. We, 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 she, she could see everything. You couldn't get away with anything. She saw everything. And she'd be floating, and man, we'd be holding our breath. Because see, actually in those days of Catholic education, you actually had accountability. You were required to learn things, and God helped you if you didn't. And so sister would be floating by and she'd come right in front of me. Johnny, why did God create you? And man, it was just like basic training. Man, my, I had to snap to attention. <laughs> sister, God created me that I might know him, love him, and serve him, that I might be happy with him in heaven for all eternity. Good boy. And I live to fight another day. That's right. That human existence has an, a, a proper object. You know, why did God create us? Well, that's why. That I might know him, love him, and serve him. Why? That I might be happy with him in heaven forever. You know, eternal salvation. That's why. That's the bottom line. It all comes down to that. We can talk a long time about these things, but it all comes down to that. At the end, and it's coming fast, I don't mean the end of the world, I mean your end and mine. <laughs> you know, we're not going to live that much longer if you, listen, a hundred years is nothing in the context of eternity. So, you know, time flies. It really does. Uh, it's one of the unwritten laws of physics. That, that It goes like this. The older you get, the faster it goes. <laughs> right? It, it's true. I mean, when I was young, time didn't go so fast. But I'm not as young as I used to be. I'll tell you, time goes fast. In the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be out of here. At the end, you and I are going to be one of two things. 
And, and you know, some people just hate this kind of talk. And that's why I love to do it. <laughs> but it's true. At the end, we're going to be one of two things, a winner or a loser, heaven or hell. That's it. And you can't get away from that. And that is the teaching of Jesus Christ. That's the teaching of the church. People don't like that. Oh, that's too, that's too stark. That's too black and white. You better believe it's black and white. They don't like black and white. The devil's favorite color is gray. He doesn't like any absolutes, no moral absolutes. You know, he, he doesn't want to say anything is good and evil. Well, if and or maybe. It's like one Baptist minister friend of mine says, Oh, yeah, they're always saying if and or but. It seems to me like a lot of these people going to hell on their butts. <laughs> always an excuse. Always an excuse. No excuses. You know, that's what they used to say at West Point when they got busted for an infraction and they got demerits, the cadets were trained to respond in one simple fashion. It wasn't if or and or but. It was no excuse, sir. No excuse, sir. Well, that was 50 years ago. But now it seems we've got every excuse under the sun. It's not that complicated, folks. It's very simple. Truth and lies, good and evil, life and death, very simple. And all the theological talk in the universe, if it's authentic, has to be distilled ultimately into that reality. At the end, we got two possibilities. One we win and one we lose. And that's it. And we've got to start working on it. So they don't want to go to church. There's all kind of reasons. Oh, well, I'm very busy. If you're too busy to go to Mass on Sunday, you're too busy. Straighten it out. Well, you know, when we're young, it happens. When we're teenagers or young adults, you know, we go out on Saturday night. And, you know, Sunday morning, we don't want to get up and go to church, right? We're all, we're kind of burned out like a smoldering ruins laying there <laughs> and so you know sometimes it starts that way man it's just too painful to get up and go to church well you got to do it well i'd rather be playing golf well do it not play golf go to church no pain no gain, no cross, no crown, no blood, sweat, and tears, no victory. And that's true in anything that I know of. Whether you're playing in a football game, whether you're engaged in military operations, whether you're in the corporate world or the church, or in the realm of redemption, no blood, sweat, and tears, no victory. It is not easy. Christianity is not a wimp religion. Write that down and put it under your hat. Christianity requires things. Sometimes those are hard things. Brutally hard things. Oh, I, I don't like the singing at Mass. It's no longer relevant to me. Well, I don't like the kiss of peace. Well, I don't like the changes from Vatican II. So I don't go anymore. On and on and on. If you stop going to Mass, if you rationalize that away, what you are doing is you're choking off the major conduit of sanctifying grace. Do you understand that in order to achieve that supernatural end I was talking about, heaven, why God created us, 
in order to achieve a supernatural end, you need supernatural means. You cannot achieve a supernatural end merely with natural means. In other words, Joe might be a heck of a nice guy. Joe is a great fella. He's nice. He even takes care of some charities. Well, he don't go to church, though. But he's an awful nice guy. <clears throat> Are natural means sufficient to achieve a supernatural end? No. They are not. Why? In order to achieve a supernatural end, sanctifying grace is required. That comes from the sacraments. Now, I know you're all mostly good Catholics here and, and you know your faith, and that's why tomorrow afternoon when I give the final exam, <laughs> lock up the doors and everything, I know you're all going to pass. And I know probably if, if I ask you what is sanctifying grace, uh, I, I bet you in this big auditorium, not more than three people wouldn't get it. But for the sake of the three, <laughs> the short answer, the easy answer is sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. In other words, to live with God in heaven forever, to enjoy the beatific vision, to see God immediately face to face without any mediated or created means, you've got to have sanctifying grace, a share in divine life. Sanctifying grace comes from the sacraments. We get it first at baptism. And then the major way that we receive sanctifying grace in an ongoing kind of a way is through the Holy Eucharist and confession or the sacrament of penance, okay? Uh, you certainly receive it when you get married or a priest gets ordained, when you get confirmed, and so forth. Every sacrament channels sanctifying grace to the soul in a unique way. So if you're not going to Mass, at least on Sundays and Holy Days, what have you done? Well, you basically choked off the flow of life. And you begin, it's like if you, if a body uh, had a diminished supply uh, of oxygen, or, or, or your hand, let's say, had a diminished supply of blood, uh, it, it would be, it could, it begin to atrophy. You know, you, you, it wouldn't function the way it ought to. So that, that's why marriages frequently break up. Because sanctifying grace isn't flowing in to the lives of the spouses. You have to have that. This is a matter of life and death. Sanctifying grace is, a, is as essential to the life of the soul as oxygen is to the life of the body. You know what happens if you don't get any oxygen to your body. You get sick, you die eventually. Same thing with the soul. Well, another way people leave the church is they have an ideological or philosophical or theological difference of opinion with the church. Uh, well, I don't agree. I've had people say this to me. Well, I, I don't agree with the Pope on this, that, or the other thing. So? So what? You know, you don't agree with them, just obey them. You're not smarter than the Pope when it comes to the Catholic faith. You know, it's like the Nike commercial says, just do it. Just do it. Yeah, I know sometimes it can be hard, and, and I'm not saying, you know, be dumb about it. God gave you a brain, and we should use our brain. But let me give you a really, really helpful, I think it's helpful, a helpful clue. This kind of thing helped me in my own journey. If you reach a juncture, where there's something you just can't swallow. You know, a teaching of the church, maybe it's artificial contraception. You know, I just don't understand why that's so bad. That doesn't hurt anybody. Why can't I do that? When you reach a juncture like that, humble yourself before God and say, okay, I'm going to accept the church's teaching, but I'm going to, I'm going to seek the truth. I'm going to study this question. See, most people don't know a silly thing about their faith. 
you know, something rubs them the wrong way and they say, well, I'm not going to do that or I don't like that. But they really haven't researched it. I have found that very few people really proceed intellectually. Even these people who have a, a difference of opinion with the church, they don't proceed intellectually. They proceed emotionally. Emotionally. They don't like it on an emotional level. And quite often, not always, but quite often, it's not an intellectual problem that they have, but a moral problem that underlies it quite frequently. So when you come to a juncture like that, if you do, humble yourself before God, because you're going to be pleasing to God. Say, all right, Lord, I don't understand this teaching on whatever it might be. But I, I'm going to I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you the, the church's teaching a chance to help me come to understanding. So you, you make the ascent of faith. There is nothing in the Bible that says without understanding it is impossible to please God. But I'll guarantee you it says without faith it is impossible to please God. So give the ascent of faith and then study, use your mind, learn what the church teaches and why. And then I think you'll, you'll, you'll go the right way. But quite often people leave, that, that's an excuse usually, but they may say that. Well, I don't like it because of this, that, or the other thing. Okay, fine. Why, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, I've outgrown my faith. I have met eight zillion people who said, oh yeah, I used to be Catholic. Well, what are you now? You know, and they may be Buddhist or who knows what. And they sometimes say, well, I outgrew my Catholic faith. I became more sophisticated. I became more educated. There's something that I have found. Now, I have some education. I earned five university degrees, most of them with highest honors. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying that to let you know that I, I respect education. I have a high regard for education. But in my many years in the around the education establishment, um, I, I, I was given a great revelation by God. And the revelation is, a lot of people done been educated into imbecility. That's what has frequently happened. People save up zillions of dollars to send the kids to Harvard and they end up with brain transplants. Some of these ultra-liberal institutions, they don't have authentic education. All they do in some of the sciences. But let me tell you what real education does. Real education is a journey. A journey into the truth, not away from the truth. And if education leads you away from higher truths whilst in the pursuit of lower truths, there's something very wrong with that scenario. And anyone who sends their children to an educational establishment like that deserves what they get. Now I'm telling you right here, I'm going to save you a lot of trouble. I'm going to save God a lot of trouble. I'm going to tell you right here, you send your kids to an ultra-liberal educational establishment like Harvard or any number of others and they, and they lose their faith and, and quite often they, they can't seem to use, they, they don't think straight anymore. Something happens to them. It's demonic in plain English and you deserve what you get. And that, by the way, you can't be undiscerning anymore. Those days are gone. You know, the days of innocence are long gone. Kiss them goodbye. Years ago, in the mid-1970s, now I'm in Rochester, New York, I can talk about this with much more force than I can some places. In the mid-1970s, the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen said this, I tell my best friends and my relatives, if you want your children to fight for their faith, send them to a public school. 
If you want your children to lose their faith, send them to a Catholic school. That's what Bishop Sheen said in the mid-1970s. That's a heck of a thing. Now, by the way, there are a lot of great Catholic schools. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of many, many good Catholic schools. There are a huge number that stink. And I wouldn't send my worst enemy to a lot of them. Why? Well, I, I, I worked in a diocese, not on the East Coast, on the West Coast, for a bishop. And I had a, a very influential position. I was the head of every department in the diocese. When the bishop hired me, he said this. He said, they won't let me be bishop anymore. I spent 80% of my time filling out material for courts, depositions and, and interrogatories and all kinds of things. They got me so tied up in court, I can't be bishop. Therefore, I'm hiring you to do my job. And he gave me 13 departments. And it was an eye-opener. I had irate parents calling me that in the Catholic schools, the little girl came home, she had just entered high school, freshman in high school, came home. <clears throat> Sister came in and handed out condoms. And the little girl came home rather confused. And the mother went in and said, why did you do that? She said, well, they're, getting, they're big women now. They need to know these things. Another time they had questions and one of them asked the teacher, why can't women be ordained priests? And sister said, because the Pope's a male chauvinist pig. And the parent wrote me a nasty letter and I don't blame him a bit. And I dealt with that for months on end. And we wonder why we've got problems. That's why. We don't like the priest. You know, we leave the church because we don't I've heard that a thousand times if I've heard it once. Well, I don't like that priest. Um, he preaches too much. He doesn't preach enough. He looked at me funny. He prays the rosary too much. He doesn't pray the rosary. I don't like the priest. Sometimes it's for a good reason. You know, uh, I mean, I, believe me, if I were a parish priest, a lot of people wouldn't like me either. And I know it. I'd be hard to live with. That's why I'll never be a parish priest. And I know, you know, it's in any society, in any close society, you can get, you know, you have your likes and dislikes. Why would you let any human being, regardless of what they did, how they act, whatever, why would you allow them to have so much power over you that they would drive you out of the church? I tell that to people who get angry and upset. They, they, they're so angry, you know, they, they've had a, they haven't talked to their brother-in-law in 20 years. I mean, and it's to the point of sin. And, and I say, look, why would you give a human being that much power over you? Why would you give any human being so much power over you that, that they drive you to distraction like that? They make you sin. Don't give anybody that kind of power over you. And don't let any priest, no matter what he does or who he is or what you don't like, don't ever let that it drive you out of the church. Oh, we had the scandals. That's another one. You know, that's another bit. Well, I left the church because of the scandal. Now, the Catholic Church can't be any good because of the scandal. Listen, this is very simple. This is a really a no-brainer. It's the most common one, but it's, it's, the, it's the easiest one to answer. Really, it is. An analogy. At a certain point in my life, God gave me a mission unlike any other that I've ever had before. I, I had a cross swords with one of the biggest health care corporations in the United States. Not what I do. It was a huge case of unnecessary surgery, heart surgery. As it turned out, a thousand people and more 
had unnecessary bypass surgery because of things, immoral, unethical things. I didn't want to get involved with that. I did. I did. It took years of my life. Four years. But I have not sworn off medicine because I saw a couple of doctors who were crooks. I would be an idiot if I said I don't accept medicine because of what a couple individuals did. You know, if I say, oh, there's lawyers are crooks, I, I won't have anything to do with law. That's dumb. The law, you know, this or that lawyer might be a crook. You've got crooks in every occupation. But you can't, you can't logically, rationally say, I want nothing to do with law or medicine. And by the same token, because of what one or two or a few priests did, you can say, the church is no good. Because certain persons fail to be faithful to what they are called to, doesn't mean that what they are called to is not noble or good or true or beautiful. And so don't, don't, don't give in to that. Walk out because of the priest or because of the scandals. That's cutting your nose off to spite your face. Makes no sense. Oh, they're all about money. Ooh, let me count the ways I've heard that one. They're all about money and they want too much money. Well, that may be true, but have you ever tried to run a major institution of any kind without money? Every now and then someone at a conference like this will start giving my people that work with me a hard time and say, Man, you charge a lot of money for this stuff. You think angels drop it from heaven? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know what it takes, how much money it takes to run a parish? Millions. I remember in my parish years ago in Hudson, we needed a new roof on the church. And it's a pretty decent church. Actually, it's exactly the same as some of the churches in the Rochester Diocese, the, the architecture of it and the building material. And um, got estimates, million bucks. Million dollars to fill, to, to, to replace the roof. And, and the priest had to raise money, you know. He had to do what he could. Otherwise, there'd be no roof. The water was already leaking in. Th you know, water leaks in, things start to rot. And then you got more, a lot more than a million bucks that you got to pay for. Oh, the upper, oh, the church is all about money. Think. Think. Now, myself, I personally don't care anymore. I've got to the point where I could just as well go out in the parking lot or in a pasture and have mass for 10,000 people out there with no repairs and maintenance to worry about. That's how they do it in Africa. I have friends that are priests in Africa. They don't, they don't have to worry about repairs and maintenance. They just do it outside in the rain or whatever. You know, the occasional herd of elephants is problematic. Oh, I left the Catholic Church because that other religion is much more biblical. We had the original version. <laughs> now, in all fairness, once again, many of these problems, quite honestly, uh, and they're real. People perceive these things as real problems, and, and we should help them. But many of these problems are brought about because we don't do things right. We, we don't, listen, we know how to read the Bible, quite honestly. We know how to read the Bible. You know what? 
The average Catholic does not. I'll guarantee you, among good Catholics, the people in this room, I, I did a series a while back and we re-edited it, remastered it, brought it out recently. It's called Word of God. I took the church's primary document on divine revelation, the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. It's called De Verbum, Word of God. And I, brought, I took the six chapters from that document and I did six one-hour lectures. <clears throat> and what it basically teaches is the, church, the Catholic Church's way of approaching divine revelation, of reading the Bible. And I'll guarantee you not one Catholic in a hundred thousand has heard anything about any of that. And I don't blame them so much because they just haven't been taught. You know, how can you know unless someone teaches you? But it's of enormous importance. And so they leave. Oh, the Catholic Church isn't biblical. Oh, it's very biblical. Way more biblical than any of the other churches. Don't believe it? You look at my series, Word of God. You never heard any of that stuff anyplace else. But that's the real way to read the Bible. If I ask you, what's sacred tradition? Oh, it's not a bunch of customs from the past. If I ask you, what is sacred tradition? Would you know? If I said, what's the analogy of the faith? Would you know? No, you wouldn't. But you should. One of the reasons we lose people is because we don't teach people. One of the reasons we don't, we don't have more people coming into the church is we don't use what we have. We don't have to come up with new things. We don't need any, any new gimmicks. I ran into a young Catholic couple one time and they were on their way to uh, Tibet. And I said, Tibet? That's a long journey. Why are you going to, to Tibet? Well, we're going to consult with the guru. Man, you, you, you're Catholic and you have the fullness of divine revelation, the full means of salvation, and you're going to Tibet to consult with the guru. Oh, happy day. Oh, here's one. Well, but the pastor wouldn't marry us. Well, you've been living in sin like pagans. Why should he? And then, oh, the, oh, and then the parents get all upset. And they get mad at the priest. We want our children to be married in the church. Well, so do I. Let them start acting like people that want to be married in the church. Start living in a state of grace. Oh, I can't stand all this talk about guilt and hell. It's driving me right out of your mind. You're out of your mind anyway. <laughs> That's a lot of baloney, man. That's an excuse. There, listen, there is such a thing as healthy guilt, acknowledging reality. Jesus Christ suffered and died on a cross to take our guilt away from us, if we would let him do it. But denial is not the way to do that. Well, there are contradictions in the Bible and in your religion, they say. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. But there is many a paradox. And you say, huh? No contradictions in the Bible. But there is a lot of paradox in the language of the Bible and in the doctrine of the faith. Paradox. What does that mean? I'll give it to you real simple. It's not a contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction. Why? We have a, a finite mind. And what we're considering is God and all things as they relate to God in a study of religion. A finite mind cannot grasp fully that which is infinite. And so many things don't make sense to us. Okay? A little humility goes a long way. 
I studied almost 12 years in universities and seminaries. I don't know perfectly everything. Oh, I know what the Catholic Church teaches, okay. I can tell you what the doctrine of the faith is. But if you ask, do you, do you, one time somebody said to me, well, Father, explain the Trinity to me and I'll become Catholic. <laughs> Man, if I could explain the Trinity to you, I'd be God and you could worship me. I can tell you certain things about it, but I can't tell you uh, completely, you know, come on, the Trinity's a mystery. Trinity's a mystery. How, uh, you cannot fully, absolutely, rationally <clears throat> explain a mystery. You can't do it. it. takes faith. Well, the church is against women. If it wasn't for the church, women would still be chattel, property. If it wasn't for the Catholic Church, in most societies, women would still be the property, property of men. The Catholic Church is what promoted women's rights for centuries, and still does. Well, I'm leaving the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is against gays. Catholic Church is not against gays. I'm not against gays. Sometimes they'll say, oh, you, you're homophobic. No, I'm not. I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> not homophobic. Well, you're against us. No. No. Matter of fact, I get them with this. Matter of fact, you and me are very much alike. Oh? No. No. You see, you and me are very much alike because both of us are called to celibacy. You because of the way you say you are and me because of a vow. We're very much alike. And the only way we'll achieve our human dignity and be happy is to live in accordance with what we are called to. And so if you are the way you say you are, then you're called to a life of celibacy, just like me. And so we should be friends, and you should allow the church to help you. The Christian God is cruel. He wants us to suffer. He made his own son suffer on a cross. That's a paradox. You know, they would say, oh, God is evil. When 9-11 happened, a lot of people said, God's evil. If God is good, how can he allow that? And, of course, anybody who'd been listening to me for years could answer that question. You know, the people that sat in my classes 15 years ago, they had the answer. If God is good, why evil? And, 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 and my students would, would rattle it right off. God permits evil in order to draw a greater good out of it. Period. And, and if you want to really understand that, you have to look at a crucifix. Long and hard. Meditate on it. The greatest evil, the greatest good. That's a paradox. Look at the cross. That's a paradox. It's not a contradiction. Paradox. The greatest evil, deicide. Creatures kill the Creator. The greatest good, the good of redemption. Dying, he destroyed our death. And rising, he restored our life. Power of the cross. Redemption is not an arm's length transaction. Jesus transformed all human suffering through the power of his cross into something magnificent. So your suffering and mine, getting older, can't do some of the things you used to, not as strong as you used to be, can't see as well as you used to, can't hear as well as you used to, all those things, you think it's lost? No, it's gain. United to Jesus and Him crucified. And there'll be power 
flowing through your life. Power of the cross. And so, yes, we leave the church for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it is understandable, but none of them are good reasons. And what's the best thing we can do? It's kind of like the army commercial. Be all you can be. Be truly Catholic. Be truly, truly, truly Catholic. Live your faith with fidelity and with strength and with courage. Be the best you can be. And I'll tell you what will happen. People will see that and they will come. And we won't have churches enough to hold them. It's coming. And it's coming soon. God bless you.